Hey, my name is Kyle McDonald and I'm an artist. I'll be talking about new kinds of machine and human intelligence, things like crowdsourcing and looking at uh, how we can work together with machines instead of being scared by them. I hope that uh, when the talk's over, you'll have a new ideas for possibilities of working with machine intelligence and thinking about the ways that machine intelligence challenges human creativity um, and gives us ideas for new possibilities for artwork. Hello. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for having me. My name is Kyle McDonald, and I'm an artist, mostly working with code. And I want to say thanks for TCDC for bringing me to CU 2016. I've had a lot of really good food in the last few days, <laughs> and uh, I can't wait for the next uh, few speakers and all the food that has yet to come. <laughs> um, today I wanted to share some ideas kind of along the spectrum of machine and human intelligence. Um, but I wanted to start by asking a question. Uh, who here identifies as an artist? Anybody? A few people? Almost no one. Who's here a designer? More people? Who's an engineer? OK. Uh, anybody a programmer? A couple people. Um, who considers themselves a craftsperson? A few people. And how about, do you think that you're a creative? Everyone should raise your hand. You're all creative. <laughs> cool, thanks. I wanted to get a feeling for kind of who I'm talking to, who's here. Um, uh, the first AI that I saw that left me speechless was a chatbot named MegaHal. Um, it was something I saw in high school. And I read a typical training session with its creator, Jason Hutchins, that went like this. Uh, in 1793, the French king was executed. Ha ha ha, correct, although executed has multiple meanings. The revolution started on July 14th. It is 14 degrees Celsius here. And it went on like this. I was in awe. Um, it turns out MegaHal was mostly a language trick. First, it would pick an important word from the user's input. Then it would look through its memory to find words that might appear before and after that one, repeating this process until it completed a sentence. Um, so even though this was a trick, uh, this had a big impact on how I saw computers, and I decided I was going to study artificial intelligence in college. Um, after a couple years of doing this, uh, I was working on a computer science and philosophy degree. Um, I started working at an AI lab, um, and <laughs> I, <laughs> the director of the lab sat me down one day and said, Kyle, I think you might be an artist. <laughs> Um, and it wasn't really meant as a compliment. It was because I was always coming up with uh, crazy ideas for new projects. And um, uh, he thought that maybe the arts would work better for me. So I went on and became an artist. Um, I've been working with different tools over the course of working with um, these questions about you know, uh, who we are and what defines us and um, how we see ourselves, how we interact with each other. Um, every time I find a new tool that helps me ask these questions in a new way, um, I try and um, investigate it technically and share it with other people in an open source way so that I can give other people a chance to ask their own questions with these tools. Um, one of these tools has been 3D scanning. In 2009, I was working with a projector and a camera to make 3D scans from scratch. Um, and then in 2011, I was working with Arturo Castro on face swapping. Um, <laughs> I'll give the rest of this presentation as Brad Pitt. <laughs> uh, and most recently, I've been obsessed with machine learning. Um, I think that it's going to kind of dictate a lot of the near future and distant future of how we see the world and how the world works, kind of like uh, Stefan was saying earlier. Um, but instead of just talking about AI, I want to talk about a kind of spectrum of intelligence that includes human intelligence. Um, and uh, human intelligence can mean a lot of different things. Um, we think of it as maybe one thing more often than we should, but it can mean things like constructing explanations or remembering things or making predictions, being creative. Um, there's a lot of different pieces of intelligence uh, that we're all coordinating all the time to make human intelligence. Um, and it seems like 
uh, <laughs> whenever we're trying to define intelligence, we get kind of tripped up because it's not just any one of these things, but it's something much more complicated. Um, I like what author and cognitive science professor Douglas Hofstadter likes to say. He says, it seems as though each new step towards AI, rather than producing something which everyone agrees is real intelligence, merely reveals what real intelligence is not. So if it was possible to uh, classify an image from a picture, like Stefan was showing, mushroom, container ship, et cetera, um, we used to think that that would be really difficult, that it would take human level intelligence to solve that problem. Um, but it turns out all we need is a little bit of mathematics and some fast computers. And it seems like maybe intelligence is something else, not just some kind of simple tasks like this. Uh, so human intelligence um, can also exist kind of in this strange space. Besides just the parts of intelligence we're familiar with, creativity, memory, um, it can also exist in um, shared space through crowdsourcing. Uh, this is a product called Mechanical Turk from Amazon. Um, and this is a service where you can uh, submit jobs for very simple tasks that humans are good at. Things like recognizing what's in a picture, or uh, looking at a receipt and identifying what's in the receipt, um, or deciding if someone said something mean or something nice. Uh, and you put these tasks on Mechanical Turk and then get people to perform them for two cents or three cents, some very cheap amount. But you ask thousands of people to do this. And through this, you can kind of orchestrate a intelligence of a crowd to answer complicated questions. Um, so uh, as an artist, I'm thinking about weird ways to use these tools. How can we apply this uh, to kind of ask new questions? Um, and I want to give an example of a project from Lauren McCarthy, um, another artist uh, that I work with. And she, was, she created this project called Social Turkers, uh, where she used this distributed, crowdsourced intelligence to upgrade her dating life. So she went on one date every night for a month, for 30 days, um, with a different person each time using an online dating service. And she took her cell phone, and without telling anybody, she kind of put her cell phone in the corner of the table and live-streamed the date to the web. And she got advice from the mechanical Turk workers about how to have a better date. So I'll play this video. So, funny story, <laughs> uh, I actually met Lauren while she was working on this project. <laughs> um, I wasn't one of the guys that she was dating, actually. I was one of the people who was responding online. <laughs> on her last date, I saw her uh, talking to this guy, and the guy said, you know, um, well, tell me about your work. You know, what kind of art do you make? And she said, well, it's kind of with computers. And he said, well, who's someone that you like? Who's someone's work that you're interested in? She said, there's this guy, Kyle McDonald. <laughs> I was like, oh, man, I have a chance. <laughs> so I emailed her right away. <laughs> um, and then we got married five months ago. <laughs> <laughs> So 
uh, we started working on projects after we were dating, um, thinking about things like crowdsourcing, artificial intelligence, relationships. Um, she's been working on this in her own practice for a long time, and it's more of a recent interest for me. Um, but instead of social turkers, where she was the body for the mechanical turk workers, um, we made this project called Noodle, which is a robotic body for the mechanical turk workers. Um, in this case, uh, Noodle has uh, some sensors, like a camera. Uh, so on one eye, it's got a camera. On the other, it's a microphone. And then there's some speakers on the side. It's got a Raspberry Pi inside, um, connected to the internet, and a battery so it can last for a long time. Um, and it has a little uh, interface that you can connect to and give it some basic directions, kind of like you're writing a letter to a human, except you have these drop-down options that you have to fill in. Um, and the most important part is when you ask Noodle to answer a question. Like here it says, answer a yes-no question. Is this person scary? Right now, a computer is not very good at doing that, but humans are really good. So what we do is we take the photo or make a recording or whatever, and then we send it to Mechanical Turk and get real people to answer that question. Um, so in that sense, the robot becomes a kind of body for this huge crowd of people. And I think um, this is kind of a recurring theme throughout some of the work I'll show today. Uh, it's about sort of separating our understanding of intelligence and identity and bodies. I think normally we feel that these things are wrapped up in one person, but I think a crowd can be intelligent and a computer can be intelligent and a robot can be a body or a human can be a body. Uh, and it's more complicated. Uh, the installation Sorting Daemon by David Rokeby from 2003 is another example of a system that makes observations typically reserved for humans. As humans, we have a strong tendency to sort people based on how they look, you know, whether they look more masculine or feminine, taller or shorter, darker skinned, lighter skinned, um, what kinds of clothes they wear. And uh, with Sorting Daemon, um, it makes some of the same observations and creates a large collage from all the imagery that it collects. Um, for me, one of the questions this work is asking is, do we want to create machines with the same biases that we have as humans? Uh, and is it easier to understand our bias when a computer is imitating it? Maybe with some distance, we can see ourselves more clearly when we try and recreate ourselves. Um, even when we try and create a boring, objective record of what we see in the world around us, our bias still creeps in and shapes and colors that image. Uh, this is a book by uh, an experimental French writer uh, named Georges Perec. He sat on a bench in Paris for three days in 1974, and he tried to transcribe everything that was happening down to the smallest details. For example, he says, uh, Genevieve Sorrow passes by in front of the cafe, too far away for me to get her attention. Um, some green emerges from a shopping bag. A 96 goes by. This is a bus. He was writing down every time a bus walked by or drove by. Uh, three groups of two, then a solitary man who comes out of the church. It's still raining, but maybe a little less heavily. One of the lessons here is that it's impossible to avoid categorization. Uh, even with all his details, many things are lost. And what is not lost is significantly simplified. Um, reading this text, I'm reminded of uh, the dream of mass surveillance. You know, CCTV cameras everywhere, uh, surveillance in our pockets with our cell phones, um, to know everything, everywhere, all the time, at once. Um, but somehow, when there's more detail to a memory, you lose the story a little bit, and it can be harder to understand what's actually going on. Uh, thinking about these ideas, I created the work uh, Exhausting a Crowd with Jonas Jongan, um, a Danish artist. We recorded 12 hours of a busy intersection in London and streamed it online with a tool that allows people to add notes to the scene. There are a few instances where it tends towards sort of surveillance stories, and people write things like, car runs a red light, which surprisingly ha does happen. Uh, but most of them are just kind of surreal and absurd observations, like I'm actually a black hole sending rubbish to other dimensions where it's properly recycled and reused. 
So these are stories that have collected over time from different people who watched this video. And this is one of my favorites. It was added really early in the project by a handful of different people, actually. And I will, uh, I'll narrate it a little bit. It says, so then I says to Mabel, Mabel, wait, look over there. Kiss me, you fool. Gotta pee. What, right here, right now? Yes, kiss me right on the lips. Couple kissing. I see you. How do I get her back to my flat? <laughs> do you think anybody's recording us? <laughs> so this isn't just one person who's created this story. This is a collection of, I don't know, I think it was six or eight different people who added this over time, over a month. What? <laughs> <laughs> Every small detail. <laughs> so, <laughs> Exhausting a Crowd is still online, and uh, last year we added another hour at another location in Netherlands, so there's even more to explore. I think that when you have a lot of data, it still takes humans to make a story of, out of it. Uh, and there's some data that only humans can make decisions about right now. Uh, but it might not be that way for long. Let's talk about machine intelligence a little bit. There is this uh, new technique <laughs> called convolutional neural networks, which is used for things like image classification, like Stefan was talking about. It's not actually that new. It's kind of from the late 90s is when it sort of gained more prominence. But um, in the last, uh, let's say, four to five years, um, it's really had some breakthroughs in popular culture. And one of these breakthroughs is this image. <laughs> Has anyone seen this image before? Wow, a couple of people, cool. So this is affectionately known as the puppy slug. <laughs> um, and this was posted online on June 16th, 2015, last summer, um, in the Northern Hemisphere, sorry. <laughs> uh, Reddit erupted in a furious debate over this image um, because it was posted anonym anonymously with a description, image generated by a convolutional neural network. And there were machine learning researchers and hobbyists all commenting on this Reddit thread saying, there's no way that could possibly fr be from a neural net, or maybe it's an algorithm, but it's some other kind of AI algorithm, not a neural net. Uh, maybe it's handcrafted somehow. Someone did this very slowly and meticulously. Um, there's deleted comments all throughout the thread, like someone was trying to hide some secret story. And the mystery continued until uh, this post, which uh, we saw for a brief moment in Stefan's slides, from Google Research, titled Inceptionism, Going Deeper into Neural Networks, um, by Mordvintsev and a few other researchers. Uh, and they showed some kind of similar images, which basically confirmed the origin of the puppy slug. <laughs> it was from Google. Uh, and journalists started writing articles about this technique saying, you know, this artwork is coming from Google's AI. This is kind of common language in, in the news that maybe like there's some massive digital brain in an underground lair at Google's offices with Sergey slowly feeding images to it. Um, <laughs> and it kind of taps into our fears, I think, about AI, that it's a kind of singular, homogenous thing. You'll see this also from IBM with the Watson branding. Watson is really a group of people. Uh, Watson is the name of the group of people. There's no one thing called Watson, uh, but it's the way that we like to think about AI is that it's like a single thing. Um, and the truth is always more boring and complicated <laughs> than could fit in a headline for any of these stories. Um, in reality, behind the scenes, um, I don't think Google was actually very happy about the PR from <laughs> Deep Dream uh, or Inceptionism um, because it's kind of weird to have like a creepy image being associated with your company. Um, <laughs> it makes the public a little uncomfortable sometimes. Um, but at least three separate organizations within Google have been created uh, or started pursuing possible creative applications of machine learning in the arts. Um, and I know there's more of these to come. Uh, with projects like Deep Dream sometimes leaking out of engineers' cubicles, most of these efforts have to be clearly justified to someone in management before they go public. Um, and to capitalize on the publicity, it makes sense, for example, for Google to sponsor uh, an art exhibition featuring artwork created with their technique, 
This was an article about an exhibition Google sponsored in San Francisco. Um, or at the Paris Cultural Institute, um, they fit machine learning into their overall goal of getting the public more engaged with art and museums. Um, or with Project Magenta uh, in San Francisco, uh, instead of muting the audio when someone uploads a Beatles soundtrack to their YouTube video, Project Magenta wants to auto-generate a Beatles-like song uh, to replace the soundtrack. Um, these are the kind of explanations that are given to people who are higher up that need to fund these projects. Um, and the reality of how all these pieces fit together is pretty complicated. Um, so the things that we see in the public are usually the situations where real research intersects with the potential for really good PR. Um, we don't hear as much from Google about what's going on uh, when DeepMind, one of the uh, subsidiaries of Alphabet, um, acquires millions of medical records from the English National Health Service. Uh, and I think if we paid more attention to the things that they don't publicize, we would be asking other questions like, how can we responsibly integrate the ability to forget into a machine learning system? That makes sense when you're thinking about medical records, but maybe not so much when you're thinking about uh, puppy slugs. <laughs> Yeah, so Deep Dream is one of the first times that the public has been enamored with the output of the neural net. These techniques have been um, used at least since the late 90s. This is a neural net that was behind most of the ATM check deposit readers. So it would read off the digits in your check that you wrote um, to understand what the amount was. Uh, and it's easy to get excited by these tools like the stuff Stefan was showing, say, oh, it's so cool, this is the future, it's going to change everything, they're gonna take our jobs. Um, <laughs> but there's an incentive to only show the best things. So on the left, this is Flickr getting called out for uh, auto-tagging features gone awry. Um, they were using the tag ape for black people. And then on the right, that's Google Photos getting called out five weeks later for the same thing. Um, using the tag gorillas for people with darker skin, and uh, you would think that maybe people would be at paying attention to this, but in reality, it, uh, companies try to bury this as quickly as possible because um, this is part of a much bigger systemic problem. Um, and it's not just neural nets. This is actually, this is an older computer vision technique uh, that was obviously only tested on people with kind of larger eyes from Europe or America, um, engineers who didn't have a very diverse team, and they never had someone who had more narrow eyes kind of test the algorithm. Um, this is what happens when you have really homogenous research groups. Um, so this isn't specific to new tools or neural nets specifically. Um, this is really kind of a recurring problem. Even in photography, since the 40s, uh, color calibration was based on these images called Shirley cards, at least in the US, um, featuring this white woman nicknamed Shirley. Um, so with photo processing labs tuned to process these cards, photographers and filmmakers had trouble capturing people with darker skin. It wasn't until 1995 that Kodak finally released their first card people, featuring people who are not white. Um, so again, this is just a recurring systemic problem that I think anyone working with uh, algorithms that have an impact on a large group of people need to be considering. Um, so in the context of machine learning specifically, I think it's important to ask who isn't in the training data and why. Uh, what privilege do these models and algorithms reinforce in society? So let's talk about what's going on actually behind the scenes in this convolutional net a little more detail. Basically, what they're doing is they're looking at two things. They're trying to extract patches from the images or features. Uh, and then they're looking at how these features are combined to predict what's present in an image. Um, so maybe the net will detect, thing like, uh, detect things like edges and spots. Maybe an eyebrow is like an edge, and, a, and an eye is like a spot. And when it sees these things combined, it can say, oh, it's an eye. Or maybe with some other features, it can say it's a human or a face. 
sometimes it's hard to disentangle where in the neural network it's detecting features and where it's talking about combinations of these features. Um, but this is still one way that researchers talk about uh, this kind of complicated process going on inside the neural network. Uh, the deep dream images, like the puppy slug, are based on reversing this process. For example, let's say you start with a network that's been trained to detect a thousand different categories of objects based on a database called ImageNet, which contains over a million images. The first step is to create a system that uh, can uh, produce an image representing a specific category. Um, you can see, according to neural nets, like a dumbbell uh, lifting weight, it's only a dumbbell if it has an arm attached to it. <laughs> so that's what a neural net thinks a dumbbell looks like internally, or that's one way we describe what these images are. Um, you can see there's a mask, an image of a library, a leaf beetle, lipstick. Uh, this is the first step, to try and get a uh, network to explain to us what is it seeing internally. Um, and then the deep dream process is based on feeding an existing image into the network, asking it what it sees, and then doing this to try and produce something that looks more like what it sees. So if you feed an image in and it sees a puppy, then it makes the image look a little more puppy-like, um, kind of amplifies the activity in the network so that things that look slightly like eyes start really looking like eyes. Uh, when Google released code implementing Deep Dream, I started exploring by applying it to a large number of images, like classics from Man Ray or Michelangelo, uh, my personal collection of glitch imagery, <laughs> testing with different settings, or ne neural nets that are trained on different kinds of uh, categories, or making animations out of series of images. That's um, Brooklyn on the left and Manhattan on the right. And then about two months after the Inceptionism post, uh, researchers from university in Germany, Tübingen, produced a paper called uh, Neural Algorithm of Artistic Style. And in the paper, they show how to imitate an artistic style when rendering a photo using a neural net. It looks impossible, like the sort of thing that should take you know, carefully trained humans who have undergone years of study and practice. But they're taking this picture, and they're taking four example paintings and producing a version of this picture in the style of those four paintings. So this is you know, Van Gogh painting this photo, or uh, Munch painting this photo, or I think this is maybe Picasso at the bottom painting Kandinsky, etc. Uh, so I, I tried the same thing as with Deep Dream. I tried to run multiple images through to produce animations and uh, run images through Western art history, uh, through the network, to try and understand what it was doing internally. <laughs> a few months later, there's another paper. This was early this year, 2016, um, called... <laughs> I'm not going to read the title. <laughs> uh, it's a long title. Um, but this is from uh, some researchers in the US uh, who are doing style transfer on more complicated situations where you can take patches from the images and recombine them. Um, so we have the drawing and the photo, and then it outputs, uh, this is the input, and then the neural network outputs uh, <laughs> a photo of the drawing and a drawing of the photo. You could also give it examples of a painting that you want to create a version or iteration of so this is one input, a painting. Maybe it's from a famous painter. Maybe it's your own work. And then you do some simple markup in MS Paint <laughs> or something um, with a few colors. And you say, this is where the water is. This is where the trees are. Um, this is one dark tree in the foreground. This is the sky. And then you draw uh, a third picture, which is how you want the pieces to be rearranged um, or organized in the painting. And this is the output. Ta-da! <laughs> That's what it does. Um, I feel like this is a little disconcerting if you're a creative person. <laughs> it feels like our jobs are really going to be taken away very soon. <laughs> um, but I think for me, uh, the thing I'm excited about when I see these algorithms um, is that it gives me more intuition for what's happening inside the machine and what's it, what it's possible of. Um, I feel like 
uh, there's only really a few people in the world who understand from the beginning to the end how a neural net works on the, uh, in software, how it's implemented in hardware, what makes it go fast, theoretically, why it works well. Um, but when we look at these pictures, we can get a deeper understanding of what's possible, and it's based on our experience of the world being combined with what the neural net is experiencing. So I think of this as a providing a human intuition for machine intelligence. Let's talk about a hybrid intelligence situation, so machines working with humans. This is a project called Terra Pattern. I worked on with uh, Golan Levin, David Newbury, a few other researchers. Um, big team sponsored by the Knight Foundation. <laughs> the first thing that got me into this project was Golan at the top left there. He came to me and he said, Kyle, do you know that cows face north? And what? What are you talking about? <laughs> and he said, it, it's true. If you look at satellite imagery from all around the world, all the cows, they're facing north. <laughs> so do deers, and no one really knows why, but you can see it if you extract it from satellite images. So I thought that was really weird, <laughs> and uh, I was wondering what other data there might be. Um, so Golan told me about some other companies who are using this kind of analysis, like people who are looking at satellite imagery to predict um, the quarterly returns of uh, malls before they, predict, uh, before they publish their profits. So if you have satellite imagery, you can look at the parking lot over the course of a quarter of a year and then see, are there a lot of customers? Are there not very many customers? And then you can sell that data to people who are trying to make predictions in the stock market. Or you can look at the Andean forest, uh, Andean Amazon forest um, from space and detect roads where people are illegally logging uh, parts of the forest. Or you can track penguins from space if you want to understand the migration patterns and their, the health of the different uh, penguin populations in the Antarctic. Uh, you can also measure things about their diet. Um, this is an image of penguin poop <laughs> uh, from space. So it turns out the easiest way to track penguins is by watching their poop trails. Uh, in the arts, people are also using um, satellite imagery for creative projects like this project, Google Faces, by Onformative Design in 2013, where they have a robot or a bot that autonomously explores Google Earth, analyzing all the tiles with a face detector and finding pictures like this. So with these projects in mind, we made Terra Pattern. And it's an open source tool which offers something like similar image search for satellite imagery to help the public find patterns of interest and democratize geospatial intelligence. Uh, it's ideal for locating specialized non-building structures, things that aren't really important on maps, things that are unmapped or not marked. If you run a normal object detector across the Earth, this is what you get. It's not quite what you want. You, know, you can see there's an umbrella at the bottom right, or a toilet seat, a paper towel at the top left. Um, so we had to train a new detector that was specific to satellite imagery. But once we did, then we were able to click on a single example of something we're looking for. Like here, we clicked on an empty oil tank, and then it will find all the other empty oil tanks for us. Or you find container yards, or school bus depots. Structures from urban planning like these cul-de-sacs, or sand traps from golf courses airport runway lines, trails from boats and rivers. This is around New York City. The idea with Terra Pattern is that uh, this kind of data can be very difficult to collect if you're just getting into machine learning and neural nets. But if you go to the website, you should be able to click on a few examples and extract uh, the data yourself pretty easily. Let's talk about a different kind of machine intelligence with recurrent neural networks. Uh, one of the most interesting things about neural nets is that they can be easy to develop a feeling for manipulating them once you have a basic understanding of the concepts. So a neural net is just addition and multiplication. Um, this is similar to the picture that Stefan was showing with the nice gradient animations. Um, you have some input and some output, and then in between you're using all of these connections to make a multiplication. And then when they all combine into one place, you're making an addition. 
that's it. Uh, there's some other little tweaks from the last 15 years that have made this a little better, but uh, that's what a neural net's doing. And the whole process of learning is about giving examples of inputs and outputs, and then trying to figure out what weights, how strong those connections should be in order to produce the correct output. One modification of this setup is to take the current state of the network and feed it as input to the next state. And this is called a recurrent neural network. It allows you to work with um, sequences of data, things like uh, text, sequence of characters, or music, sequence of notes. Uh, music can also be sequence of audio samples. Um, there's all kinds of sequences in the world that have a non-fixed length that recurrent neural nets are good at dealing with. And the kind of deep dream moment, or the moment of really like invading pop culture, uh, was this project called Char RNN, or Character Recurrent Neural Network, uh, by Andre Karpathy um, from last summer in May 2015. Oh, I gotta get this summer thing, winter thing straight. Uh, May 2015. So if you feed char RNN a few megabytes of text, of example text, uh, then it will start outputting more text in that style automatically. So if you feed it uh, all of the collected works of Shakespeare, then it will publish something like this. Oh, if you were a feeble sight, the courtesy of your law, your sight and several breath will wear the gods. With his heads and my hands are wondered at the deeds. So drop upon your lordship's head and your opinion shall be against your honor. Doesn't really mean anything, <laughs> but it kind of sounds like Shakespeare, which is interesting. This is a neural net that doesn't have any understanding of human culture. All it did was it knows about the character sequence that happens in Shakespeare, one character at a time. And when it produces this, it produces it one character at a time. If you feed it Wikipedia, then it will start outputting something like naturalism and decision for the majority of Arab countries capitalized was grounded by the Irish language by John Clare. And it even knows how to make references to other articles that may or may not exist. Um, <laughs> there's also some typos, imminenares, I don't think that's a real word. Um, but you'll notice it has this ability to balance syntactic correctness with novel text. Normally, when you're generating text, there's a kind of trade-off between things being correct, grammatically, syntactically, and novel. But with a recurrent neural net, it seems to be doing both simultaneously. So <laughs> we can feed the output of a convolutional neural net that's built for image recognition into a recurrent neural net, which is built for caption generation. And oops, there we go. And we get something like this. This was last summer in uh, Amsterdam. A room with a window and a window. Bicycle is parked on the side of the street. Motorcycle parked in a parking lot. Boat is parked on the side of a river. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. So I found these guys at the hot dog stand. And they saw me because I was holding my computer like this. <laughs> and they're like, what? What did that just say? So I came over to talk to them. It's uh, it's trying to figure out yeah, well, who you are. Man, Mr. Right? Uh, uh, you got a and a on the man. A man holding a hot dog. What? So it knows they're eating hot dogs. <laughs> Uh, so I tried going in a more personal direction, too, by feeding it a bunch of chat history with Lauren. <laughs> and it outputs something like this. Lauren says, so, did you see Venimore? 
Yeah, we only hear it out since that you were kind of because it could be last year. So he was quickly saying that might be real time. <laughs> mm, I guess it would. Ever want a trash support of general? Smiley face. <laughs> His one's weird mids. <laughs> yeah. And then she sends me a GitHub link, which is very common. <laughs> This is not a real link. It's just something that the neural net invented. And then I send her a Twitter link in response. Um, the lines are the right length. It feels kind of well paced. Uh, Lauren writes Y-A, and I always write yeah with Y-E-A-H. Um, and it captured all of these details, which feels weirdly personal. Um, I tried doing a huge movie dialogue database, and it was almost nonsensical. It turns out I just didn't have a big enough computer because Google tried it again a few months later, and it came out like this. What is the definition of altruism? If you don't believe in God, then you don't know. OK, so what is the definition of morality? Well, the truth is, you're not a believer in God Almighty. <laughs> well, tell me the definition of morality. I'm quite upset now. I'm not ashamed of being a philosopher. <laughs> I just tried it last night. <laughs> and it, I wanted to show you the process of the neural network learning uh, step by step. So this was with the Thai Daily News website. Um, I gave it, I think, uh, probably two years of news articles. Um, and it starts, it's totally broken. You know, There's all these missing characters, and the encoding is wrong. Then it starts to understand how to not make encoding mistakes and only do letters that kind of are correct, even though they're not organized in any reasonable way. But then it starts to get better, even reproducing names from the Latin alphabet. <laughs> Lunu Cheni Mayak, 2016. <laughs> it's even opening and closing You see the parentheses over here? This is amazing. OK, I got one more. <laughs> so this is after 5,000 iterations. I've been told that this is funny. <laughs> but it's, it's made it past the completely random stage. It's made it past the syntax stage. Um, but it still doesn't understand really how to make a meaningful story. That's sort of the next step. Um, Another kind of text that you can work with is uh, SVG files. Um, so this is an example of uh, like an um, illustration uh, that is a vector art file. And this is just characters like any other text. So if you feed a lot of examples of SVG, like let's say the Twitter emoji data set, then <laughs> you get output like this. So this is supposed to be new emoji <laughs> according to the neural net. This one is called Clock Face 9. It comes up with a name for all of the emoji. Here's a bigger collection to show some of the variety and the output. It's amazing to me to see how the big circles that go along with faces consistently find their way into the mix somewhere. And some other barely recognizable shapes are scattered throughout. Uh, the colors are pretty consistent since the Twitter emoji uses a restricted palette and char RNN learns to memorize it. Uh, I want to mention. Uh, one more technique, and then I'll wrap up with some thoughts. Um, this is a technique called dimensionality reduction, which you can think of like when you have a 3D object like your hand, and then you look at the shadow. This is taking a 3D object and making it 2D. That's dimensionality reduction. Um, uh, when researchers talk about dimensionality reduction, they normally mean taking hundreds of dimensions, higher than we can visualize, and reducing it to something that we can visualize, something that's 2D or 3D. Uh, so for example, a 10 by 10 pixel image, really small grayscale image, is made of 100 numbers, right? One number for each pixel, um, or 100 dimensions. Uh, but if each of these images contains a handwritten digit, a uh, more useful representation might be a 10-dimensional representation, where each dimension represents uh, 0 or 1, whether it's a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So if it was a 5, then the fifth dimension would be 1, and all the others would be 0. That's a, that would be a kind of cool dimensionality reduction uh, application. Um, but you can also use this for kind of more generic visualization purposes, like on the left here, this is taking uh, these digits 
from here, a big data set of about 50,000 handwritten digits, and then plotting them automatically to kind of cluster the similar digits together. So this blue uh, cluster over here is all the sixes. This red cluster up here is all the zeros. Um, and this can be really helpful when you're taking complicated data to sort it by a similarity. The technique that's being used here for dimension dimensionality reduction is called TSNE, uh, like this, T-S-N-E. And this is one of my favorite algorithms of all time because it's like magic. <laughs> you basically give it a bunch of data and it puts similar things next to each other. Um, from a distance, you can see this kind of global structure. And then when you zoom in, you can start to see all of these are fives, those are threes, and some sevens, some eights. And you can see that there's a um, kind of structure within the clusters. If you're going to run images through a convolutional neural net, it would give you a description of each image. And you could use this high dimensional description to feed it through TSNE and then make a kind of similarity clustering. So I'm going to show you a similarity clustering of multiple images. This is from a big data set. Oops, there we go, great. This is from a big data set uh, from Itsuo Sakane, who's a researcher in Japan, um, who's been recording media art history for the last, I don't know, 40 years. Um, and what's going on here is that uh, I took a lot of images from his data, and then I fed them into a neural net to extract a description of all of the images. So each image has one description. And then TSNE does dimensionality reduction. It takes this really high dimensional description, and it reduces it to two dimensions, just a point in space, so that the things that are similar to each other end up close by. Um, and you can see this area over here. This is all the faces. It's kind of learned to put all the faces together. And if we zoom out, we can find some other interesting areas, like I think over here there's some text. So these are all, whoops, these are all presentations. I can relax it a little bit to try and give everything a little more space to breathe. This is more like the white text on black backgrounds, and somewhere else there's black text on white backgrounds. Some of the groupings are really um, kind of creative, like this area up here seems to be all of the circular objects like the moon, and the sphere, and this piece from EAT. You have this kind of psychedelic color texture area. 90s 3D graphics by Nam Junpeik. Maybe it's not 90s, when is this? 70s, 80s. <laughs> Is there anything else interesting? Down here you have all the color bars from the beginning and the end of the tapes. Some of them are slightly different formats. OK, switching back to the presentation. But this general idea is about uh, taking really complicated things and uh, sorting them with a computer in a way that is easier for humans to understand. Um, oh, actually, I'm going to go straight back to another demo. So we can do this with sounds as well. Um, this is a collection of sound fingerprints. So if I say, uh, uh, let's say, if I go, that's this sound right here. It's like a lot of quick noise bursts. Or if I go, ah, oh, that's this sound with like a strong pitch and some overtones. And if I go, that's this one. And that one up there is me going like that. These aren't my sounds, but <laughs> these are a collection of sounds from a database I've been collecting over time. Uh, so the same way that we sorted the images, we can also sort sounds so that the similar ones are next to each other. And this is a collection of about 40,000 sounds. And I made it searchable so that all the bass sounds are in one area. Like drum, this is a lot of drum sounds. And you can see, like with the numbers, there's a structure within each cluster. 
So these are like the dirty hi-hats. And these are the really tight, closed ones. I like this section over here. It, it turns out I have like 50 cowbell sounds. Goodbye. And if that's fun, if that looks fun or interesting to you, I've been working with some people at the Creative Lab in Google uh, in New York to make a publicly accessible version of that. Intelligence in between, from machines to humans and back. Um, I want to give a few more examples of kind of creative work, not just techniques um, that's on that are along the spectrum uh, between human and crowdsource and machine intelligence working together. So this is a project, Blind Self Portrait that I made in 2012 with Matt Metz. And <laughs> I'm going to turn the audio off for this. Um, so <laughs> we basically were imagining what would happen if the human is just a small part in a large complex system, if it's only the last component in a mostly computational algorithmic system. Um, so we have a laptop that we set up for this installation. This was kind of a demo where we went to an exhibition and we did a one night kind of party. Uh, and we asked people to close their eyes. And the moment they close their eyes, the, compu the computer starts moving their hands around so that they can draw a self-portrait. It's a self-portrait that you could never draw yourself because your eyes are closed. Um, and uh, it's a really uncanny experience to feel like the computer is guiding you and that uh, this drawing is not really yours, um, but it's something you produced somehow or you had a hand in producing. Um, I think uh, this captures a little bit of our fear with AI or one of our fears with AI, maybe that we will treat, um, maybe that AI will treat us the same way that we've treated other people in the past, <laughs> um, that we'll just be like a piece of a puzzle. Uh, and um, I'd, like to, I'd like to imagine that we can have a more complex relationship than that. Um, this piece is uh, an exhibition by Jonas Lund, uh, a Swedish artist in 2013. It's an exhibition called The Fear of Missing Out, where he had a bot that went through a lot of contemporary art history and the contemporary art market, including descriptions of work. And he asked the bot to give him guidance to make a new exhibition. Um, so for each of the pieces in this exhibition, uh, it was decided by the AI what should be there. So this one's called Cheerfully Hats Sander Selfish. Doesn't really mean anything. but uh, <laughs> And then the description is coconut soap, seven minute, 50 second video loop. So he took that description and interpreted it in a way that he thought would make sense in a contemporary art context. This piece is called Black Sunday Satire, Ping Pong Table Behind Non-Reflective Glass. <laughs> this is a kind of um, uh, hybrid intelligence, I'd say. Jonas decides to be the body for the computational artist. Um, in this piece, uh, this is... Uh, <laughs> this is called Random Darknet Shopper by Media and Group Bitnik from two years ago, 2014. Um, and they have this laptop here connected to the dark web uh, to some online markets for illicit substances and goods. Um, things like uh, knockoff jeans, um, I think there's some ecstasy in here somewhere, illegal passports, uh, illegally like against trademark um, shoes, uh, uh, cap that has a surveillance camera in it, a soda can that has a secret space for hiding illegal things. Um, and what they do is they set up the, the laptop in the gallery like this, and they have it order something new every day at random. <laughs> and they have it come, it gets ordered to the, uh, to the gallery, and then they just install it in the gallery as like a new thing that this bot has decided to collect. Um, so with all these examples, 
of kind of hybrid intelligence, machine intelligence, human intelligence, I hope you're asking yourself, well, where is that boundary between what makes us human and what's not human, especially in the creative um, domain? Uh, so I want to ask you a few questions about whether things are made by humans or by computers. So this, check, this section is going to be focused on music. We're going to call it bot or not. Uh, this first example, let's see what you think. OK, so who thinks that this song was made by a human? Raise your hand. OK. Good, 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 good. All right, who thinks this song was made by a robot? Oh, wow. OK, so you're all wrong. <laughs> this is an Irish folk tune, uh, and it's called Butterfly. And it's a very traditional um, folk tune. But it does sound kind of robotic, so I understand why you think that. Let's try another one. Okay, bot, human, uh, a little more confused, good, you should be confused, but you're right this time, it's a bot. So this robot was trained on a huge collection of Irish folk tunes. <laughs> That's why it sounds kind of like the one before. Uh, this is from last year. Uh, it was trained on 14,000 Irish folk tunes, and that was its interpretation of what an Irish folk tune should sound like. Next one. All right, uh, bot, anybody? Yeah, okay, human? Yeah, you're all wrong again. That's a robot. <laughs> That's by IBM Watson from earlier this year. Um, and again, remember, Watson means the Watson team. It's a bunch of people. Um, and one of their projects of these people is they've been working on making music automatically. In this case, it's a little hybrid. Someone sits down with a keyboard and plays uh, da -da something like that. And they give it to the bot, and it makes a whole song based on that three-note melody. Bot or not? <laughs> bot! All right. <laughs> All right, next one, next one. <laughs> Not human? OK, you're wrong again. This is WaveNet by DeepMind. Uh, so uh, this song, or this uh, small excerpt of a composition, uh, is based on listening to tens of thousands of videos on YouTube of people playing piano. And remember char RNN? It makes text one character at a time. This makes audio one sample at a time, the shortest uh, kind of chunk that you can have of audio. It generates da, 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 the wave over time slowly. Um. Not. Oh, good. All right. You know you're you know you're a dubstep. That's a <laughs> that's Entrapment by Silky, a UK musician. I think this might be the last one. You're getting better. Human? <laughs> You're pretty much evenly divided. Uh, so that is a robot from 1996 by David Cope. No neural nets, nothing special. He basically sat down and fed it a bunch of Chopin, uh, and it created its own version of Chopin from examples. Uh, 
it's a human performing it in this case. So the bot produces a sheet music. And there's a lot in the dynamics, right? It feels like a lot of what we think of when we listen to music is about relating to someone. I mean, for me at least, I think uh, when I hear something, I'm imagining myself connecting to another person. And I think uh, it's possible for a machine to produce something that we feel like we can connect to, uh, but I haven't heard any really good examples yet. For me, it's interesting that this from 1996 is still pretty human and the last step of the human performing it is maybe a small part of what makes it good music. Um, so this is a question I've been asking myself a bunch. If you have, uh, think of your favorite, maybe a uh, piece of traditional folk music or classical music, um, something that could be written down, let's say, uh, something that could be printed out by a computer and then given as instructions to someone else. For me, one example is Claire de Lune by Debussy. Um, let's say that Debussy never wrote Claire de Lune, and instead, a robot wrote it tomorrow. And the question I have for you is, would it sound the same? Would you feel like it's the same song? Would you be moved the same way? You know, think of your, again, like whatever your favorite song is, pretend that it was actually just written by a bot. Does it still feel the same way to you? I don't know. I wonder if a song by any other author sounds as sweet. It's kind of this Shakespearean idea, a rose by any other name. Um, I've been wondering what's, uh, what kind of cultural artifacts are beautiful, even without a backstory, even without a human behind it. Uh, is a work of fiction? Like, if you read a really good novel, is that good, regardless of whether a human wrote it or not? Um, even if it's really complicated, in theory, a robot can still write a novel. We just saw some simple examples of char RNN generating short text um, or a culinary concoction. Uh, this is obviously going to be a very contentious one in this country. <laughs> um, but I wonder, if you eat really good food, does it matter if it wasn't made by a human? OK, one more audio sample. I'm, and I'd like to ask, what language is this? Do you have a rubbish here about to the given as well? But it's going to be a tire set key. I just wrote a game that's out. Well, we're not as a judge. Can you watch some of our first eyes? Any guesses? These are, these are a few options. Irish, anybody? OK. Uh, Welsh? Danish? Yeah, Danish is a pretty weird language. Uh, <laughs> other? OK, all right. Uh, so the others are right. This is actually English. <laughs> it's a really weird kind of English that was trained by DeepMind. So instead of listening to uh, tens of thousands of uh, audio samples of people playing on YouTube. Uh, they trained it by hundreds of hours of audiobooks, people reading audiobooks uh, in English. And this is its understanding of what English sounds like. So in a way, it's not really a language at all. It's sort of the machine's understanding of um, how English sounds. So I'll finish with this question from David Horvitz, which I love. He's a conceptual artist based in Los Angeles. Um, and he was asking, can we program an AI to have an existential crisis? <laughs> to ponder the origin of the moon, to question authority, to live? I don't know. I'll leave you with that question. Thank you. How would this enhance or how would this challenge culinary mm. conception or cooking or mm. culture? That's a good question. I think uh, it might be a great question to ask in Thailand specifically <laughs> um, amongst each other. Uh, I don't know that I have the best answer for it. Um, my experience of cooking comes mostly from my mom, who is huge. Uh, she has a huge love of food and is one of the best chefs I've ever eaten from. And uh, she, um, I guess what I learned from a young age was that uh, there are so many different kinds of foods that can be good, uh, and that the more that I can expand my mind, the kind of more appreciation I can have for everything that's come before. Um, so maybe if there is some place for uh, automatic systems or AI in cul culinary arts, maybe it's in expanding our ideas in ways that we hadn't considered before. Um, I think humans, uh, we get locked into patterns and trends really easily, and hopefully uh, some of these automatic systems can break us out of those a little bit. 
Um, so what does all this technology mean for the future of how people do business? Yeah, that's a good question. So I asked Stefan earlier about capitalism. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, you know, I'm an artist, not a businessman. So, uh, m but my feeling is that uh, the way that the economy has been run for millennia might not be sustainable in the long term. Um, I think that there's a lot of people who um, don't have a lot, and there's a, a lot of people that aren't being served by the way the economy is set up right now. And I'm looking forward to a possibility of an economy where uh, most of the things that um, made the economy run are being automated, uh, and the people at the top uh, aren't so high at the top that they've kind of distributed their resources more. Um, and I think that's possible uh, with, in the future, but I think it's something that we have to do very consciously. I don't think that it's going to happen accidentally. I think if um, you know the people who are making developments in AI and machine learning right now continue the way that they've been, um, it's going to increase kind of a um, income gap and economic disparity between people. Um, so I would say if there's a future for humanity at all, it's going to be in kind of distributing resources better and automating things more. If AI learn from what existed, can mm. they ever learn to create new things, new theory, new style of art, etc.? This is one of my favorite questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, and normally the way I answer it is by asking the audience, uh, do you think that you can create something new? Do you think you can create a new style of art, new theory, new concepts? And uh, I don't know, it's kind of a complicated question to answer. In some ways, I feel like I can, that I can try new combinations of things, but I don't know if it's ever fundamentally new. I think a lot of what humans do as artists is about combination and referencing and sampling. Um, so I think the extent to which an AI can do that, then it's actually very human in a way. Um, getting beyond that, I think it's going to be less a question of, you know, is the AI doing something new and more uh, can it convince us that what it's done is new, um, which is a kind of different question. I think if you see new work, something that looks new from someone else, part of it is because they convinced you it's new. They've presented it in a way that it feels new. But whether it's actually new or not, it's more complicated.